Uh, and the, the last bit to cover, and we kind of hinted at it with um, talking about the 23rd century uh, designs lasting through, is it's just, just any thoughts on Strange New Worlds. I haven't seen all of it yet. I've seen the, the scene of the, the Romulan fleet. That's, that's basically all I have in my brain right now. Mm. So, I mean, well, you've got um, Progedy and Strange New Worlds. And unfortunately, outside of a few clips, uh, a few a few screenshots and things, I haven't seen any of either. Um, mm -hmm. I've actually, did, uh, from what I've heard, Strange New Worlds is really good, which has made me even more determined not to watch the various clips you see on uploading on right, YouTube, right. because okay, I want it to be so spoiler free when I watch it. Um, basically, because I think both of those are locked behind Paramount Plus. Yeah, well, uh, funnily enough, a I hasn't mean, launched in the UK or just about has question mark. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, just it's launched. launched. Um, and well, one, yeah, it, therefore, you know, it's because I, I think it's New World, Strange New World, has been out in the states for a, a while. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we haven't had it unless you want to be very sneaky about you know using VPNs and stuff. Um, but mm. also, frankly, I'm getting sick and tired of subscribing to so many. <laughs> Yes, I mean, for, for the, reason, the reason the reason I've been able to start watching is because um, one of the sort of conventional telly packages, mm. the, the conventional telly package we've got we've subscribed to, is actually con uh, includes Paramount Plus. It's just, oh. just been added in, so that's been how I've been able to do it. Because yeah, one of the Sky I'm, ones. Yeah, it's one of the Sky ones. Oh, I might I might have to pop over to my parents then. Oh, actually no, mm. But, mm. I'm. No, yeah, actually, I've I've just realised. Well, I don't, you know, Sky executives probably aren't listening. Um, I actually have the uh, like the Sky Go login for my parents' ah, Sky ah, account. The that's... same because at the same way, well, while we're at it, I let them use my Netflix account. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, if yeah. they've got if they've got Paramount Plus on their Sky package, I might therefore be able to watch it there. Because I mean, uh, that's the thing. I when they announced Paramount Plus, I was looking at it going. <sighs> You're you're just trying to make money off of this because Lower Decks and Picard yeah. and Discovery were all on Amazon Prime, and I was perfectly happy to watch them on Amazon Prime. But considering I'm currently subscribed to Amazon Prime, Netflix, Disney Plus, um, <laughs> and uh, well, what's it? Apple TV. Oh, blimey. Yeah, I was like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to add a fifth subscription. And to be honest, I'm thinking, I'm mm. seriously thinking about dropping Netflix because there's virtually nothing of interesting there anymore. Yeah, um, yeah, but, yeah. We yeah. could, yeah, we could get into a whole conversation about the 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 modern media meta. Um, yes, which you know, plenty of people have talked about red letter media. Talk mm. about it all the time. Just endless streaming services with endless endless stuff to try and keep keep you hooked. Yeah, it's not it's you know, and that's a, that's maybe a concern is like it's just little. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I think I think the concern is the concern. I sorry, I was just going to say little tangent here is that yeah, the, the what they're going to be focused on with these. Um, platforms is they're going to be focused on frequency of content rather than kind of uh quality it's not so much about you know having it's just having enough shows that you can have a franchise running constantly sort of thing so constant star wars shows or near enough constant star wars yeah. shows and i i think the pro i think the problem is now with all of these people trying to cash in it's actually going to bite them very hard soon a lot of them um because mm. i mean the whole point of netflix used to be that everything you wanted to watch was everything in one place in one place yeah and yeah now, now there's almost at least for for my interest there's almost nothing worth watching on netflix that i can't find elsewhere um hence why i'm thinking of dropping it but a lot of these other things I have a feeling they could get far too niche. I mean, those like um, Games Workshops, Warhammer TV. Um, what? what? It, I didn't yeah, even know, I know that was a thing. Yeah, it's another, another subscription service. Now, the thing is, I like 40K. I'm a huge 40K, Battlefleet Gothic, etc. fan. Mm. But I'm not subscribing um, to Warhammer TV. I'm not paying as much as I would be paying for, you know, Netflix or 
Disney or whatever um, a month for what is necessarily going to be a limited amount of content produced per month or whatever whatever their release schedule is it, it's just not what there's not the value in it for me um, no there, there's just there's there's not there's not enough content there and it's not a it, unfortunately it's not a broad enough um franchise to have enough content on there to make me want to subscribe at least yeah, with yeah. Games Workshop's current business practices, which we won't go into because that's that is completely off topic. But it the, the yeah. kind of loops around to what I, my worry with Paramount Plus is that if, to be fair, Paramount Plus is basically riding on, and pinned all its hopes of success on we're the only ones with the latest Star Trek. So mm. you you either subscribe to them or you don't get it. Yeah, um, yes. At which point it's like, okay, I like Star Trek, but do I like Star Trek enough to be paying you basically for the exclusive privilege of the of some Star Trek series? Because let's yes, yes. let's face it, even if they move the next season of Lower Decks and they've got Prodigy and they've got Discovery and they've got uh, Strange New Worlds, that's still only even if they were all running releases concurrently per week, that's still only three hours of media a week. Yes. yes. Um, yeah, yeah. And I'm sorry, but if I want three hours of entertainment a week, I could slap a couple of long history documentaries up on YouTube and yes. I don't pay yes, for that. Yes. So, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, that was going to say, if you want documentaries, tons of them on YouTube. Yeah, so I have, I have a significant fear that it's probably not going to do as well as they thought and then they're going to start cutting star trek content and basically say oh it's not popular enough when in fact if they released it on a, something with a broader base appeal like netflix or amazon prime they probably would have gotten a lot more viewers i mean to be honest i only have amazon prime video because it comes with my amazon prime subscription which i mainly have because mm. i like not having to pay extortionate rates of shipping on everything i buy from amazon yes um and to be honest the only the only reason i'm signed up with disney is you know as much as I'm also a huge Star Wars fan, I think if Disney Plus only had Star Wars and all the various ongoing series, I probably still wouldn't have signed up for it. But Disney has yeah. the kind of the the, the many just... the many arms of the mouse are such that they've got yes, the yes, MCU yes, yes. and all the other stuff every... on them. <laughs> yes, it's just hoovered everything up into into one place. Um, so yeah. yes, I mean, so it's actually so worth that's... having. <laughs> yes. So that's that's our little tangent on on yes. modern media. Um, I'll just go on to uh, another question now because I think we've covered New Trek as best as we can, given yes. your rant about um, Paramount Plus streaming services. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Empire Empire points out that we never really covered the Akira properly. We we talked about it, but we didn't really settle on where it where it would fit. So what so kind of cruiser mm. it would be, um, or if it would even be a cruiser. Um, and then also, like, then there's, there's the broader conversation of, sort of, I'm just thinking the, his, the, the historical comparison. In the modern day, you have um, missile cruisers, or yes. guided missile cruisers, also in the US Navy, mm. uh, because they can afford to have that kind of size and everything. Mm. Um, historically, were there, like, in the period we're talking about, were there ever torpedo cruisers or a larger ship armed with a heavy torpedo armament? Um, they were, actually. And a actually, they kind of, in the period that we originally, when we originally started this series, the period we kind of n nailed as where we want, where we think uh, Star Trek draws most of its inspiration dash ideas from the late 19th century um there were actually torpedo specifically named torpedo cruisers in that era um yeah. with the, the the objective being their primary armament was supposed to be torpedoes and well as yes yeah, the idea is just they're basically supposed to run in with the destroyers uh, behind the destroyers yeah. and deliver significant torpedo volleys uh, to kill capital ships whilst having an armament substantial enough to kind of bully their way through torpedo boats and destroyers that might try and get in their way. Uh, which, weirdly enough, is a principle that never quite went away. 
the US Navy in the uh, sort of in aftermath of the uh, First World War, they started to ditch torpedoes on their cruisers, but nobody else did um, to varying okay. degrees. Um, so you've got I think I mean the British still kept a fairly substantial torpedo armament on a lot of their cruisers and they always kept torpedoes on their cruisers even if it was a lesser armament up, up to and just past the second world war um, but of the big navies the Japanese were the ones who embraced the idea of torpedoes the most they I was, uh, yeah I was yeah, about to say just the first, first thing, thing when I came, came up, up uh, on, on Google, Google mm. is the, uh, the Kitakami uh, Kit Kitakami yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, now th th those were those were some rather specialized ships, the Kitakami and the hilariously named Oi. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so th those were full on torpedo cruiser conversions, although they never actually got to use them. Um, but even the even the more regular mainline Japanese cruisers like the Miyoko's, Megami's, and uh, Takao's, they all still had a fairly heavy and substantial torpedo armament, uh, mm. which they were in theory supposed to use as much if not more so than their main guns it kind of depended on the target if if things had gone according to the way the japanese had planned um then those cruisers would have actually used their torpedoes as more of an offensive weapon than their guns but as it turned out things didn't work out the way the japanese thought and they ended up mm. using their guns more than their torpedoes in general but it doesn't obviate the i the fact that that was the idea originally so the there, there are past parallels to the akira um okay but given its size and firepower i'd say the akira probably fits comfortably into the heavy cruiser niche mm. uh, or, you know, yeah because yeah. i mean well just the only thing that kind of makes me question that is that it's still lighter than the lunar class which is built with the same kind of components mm. but that has a full-on secondary hull whereas the uh, the Akira, for all that it is, is just a giant saucer. Yes, uh, with a with a kind of this blister engineering blister stuck underneath. Yeah, which is what kind of makes me. That, that's where it kind of hits me, and where I'm like hesitant. Okay, well, is it a is it a heavy cruiser? Because then, if that's a heavy cruiser, what are we going to call? What would we call the Luna? Granted, the Luna only comes out towards the end of the war or you know after yeah. the war i mean to be honest the the lunar class the lunar class is verging on a small capital ship it it, mm. it has theme because yeah, it's got this full engineering hull it's it's almost like a stretched out faster nebula faster looking nebula mm. for the next generation of design um especially with the with sort of the pod stuck on top it very mm. much does, it's kind of yeah it's the next tech generation of nebula which we kind of established is at the 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 low the small the lower end of capital ships in, yes, yes in many ways it's, it's, uh, so i i think that the, yeah the lunar up. just tips over the edge the scale into capital ship territory whereas the akira sits at, still sits at the cruiser okay um okay. Level. And, and i mean given that there's kind of our heavy cruiser bracket it does have a a rather mixed variety of ships there's like there's no kind of there's a certain standard but we've got things like the vorcha in there as well as the ambassador mm. as well as now the akira which while it's a bit of a mixed bag they're all kind of roughly on a par size wise overall offensively and defensively vaguely yeah. cap the similar capabilities and again, actually has a fair degree of parallel in in history, because if you look at the various various classes of ship, especially in the late 19th century bracket that we've established, the heavy or in that time armoured cruisers are the ones that actually see the most variation. Because you okay. see torpedo cruisers, you see um, armoured cruisers that are armed almost entirely or with very large caliber weaponry for their size others that have very sm only small caliber weaponry most of them have some kind of intermediate mix between large and small some are faster some are slower mm. um the, it, and yeah it, it's i think it, it's the class with the with the widest variety of design styles which also seems to carry over into star trek 
Okay. So yeah, I mean that that, that works, works very well. And equally, I'm just thinking the other uh, sort of because also the Akira, it's a bit of out of the blue in canon because it's just this torpedo spamming cruiser. And but then in in beta canon in Fasa you have the Andor class, which goes back to the motion picture era. And that is it. Well, it's called it's called in its day a missile cruiser, or certainly that's what FASA calls it. But I think it's a torpedo cruiser. Um, mm -hmm. But it, that's an interesting because that's a very it's again built using Constitution parts, uh, but it's actually in some ways heavier than the Constitution, um, which I just think is um, sort of interesting and kind yeah. of. For me, the, the 23rd century is defined by these the heavy cruisers, and you have the Constitution, which is like that sort of jack-of-all-trades, sits in the middle very nicely. And then you have the Andor, and the um, Constellation, which are very different and very uh, exotic designs. Mm -hmm. Let's look. Oh, yep, oh my goodness. <laughs> I, I, m oh. much as i love much as i love m most of what fasa comes up with um this one is not one of them <laughs> see okay look at it from if you look at it from the top it's fine kind of yeah and and the the, the, the reason that i kind of like it if you want a kind of a better looking version there's the andor mark ii which is the same thing but with uh, excelsior parts hmm and that, I think it just fits the, I think that aesthetic just works with it much better. The thing that kind of has me liking the Andor as a torpedo cruiser yeah. uh, concept is that the torpedoes are off in their separate uh, modules on the side of the ship, which means that it doesn't have all these um, problems that the Constitution has of having the torpedo bay and torpedo launcher in the neck, sharing room with the warp core and posing yeah. all the dangers that that does. I mean, I appreciate the overall layout and the idea of it, but flipping heck, those torpedo blisters are massive. And well, especially yeah, on the original one. Yeah, yeah, on the original, on on the on the Andor two, it actually doesn't it doesn't look too bad, but on the original, it's yeah, aesthetically, it's a bit of a disaster. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. I think it's a bit of a marmite. I think it's a bit of a marmite ship. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, as I said, I can understand the the concept, and I approve of the concept in general. It's just if it was up to me, and someone said, "Here, here's two socking great torpedo blisters. Stick these on kind of the rest of the hull that is the Andor design." I can think of a few different ways I would have done it. <laughs> yeah, yeah probably, probably probably i mean the the other thing that i like so you've got the torpedoes nice and safe elsewhere which mm. kind of carries through to the akira that's a very similar um approach that they take with that is because mm. most of the torpedoes is off in that pod uh the other thing they do is with the andor is they're protecting the nacelles the nacelles are tucked away behind the main hull so that mm -hmm. they're effectively protected from incoming fire, which the uh, well probably to its benefit, aesthetically speaking, the uh, Akira doesn't do. Um, mm -hmm. Instead, it takes on I think, and I've said this before, a more Klingon design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it is almost an attempt to do that, isn't it? Yeah, because everything's sort of angled. Everything's angled very forward, uh, and and the nacelles are sitting very low as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that that is a. Um, it's a, it's an interesting branch, I think, and I, I I like that it kind of makes sense that it comes and goes as well, particularly as and when Starfleet feels they are most at threat. So the you know if they were if they were in more conflict during the twenty fourth century maybe they would have invested in a torpedo cruiser. In fact, maybe it was on their mind, but then they realized, oh, 
we can just modify the New Orleans to do that, and that's far cheaper. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, the magnitude of threats in the late 23rd century with the threat of a Klingon invasion, or in the 24th century with the Borg and the Dominion. And, you know, those threats do actually warrant a dedicated torpedo cruiser. Yeah, I think aesthetically it kind of helps that you know, photon torpedoes are of a given size, so mm -hmm. any external pod launchers for them are going to be of approximately a similar scale, unless you go completely bananas with the magazine capacity. Mm. But as the ship sizes get larger, it becomes easier to integrate them into the ship overall. So by the time you get to something the size of an Akira, it fits into that roll bar quite nicely without compromising the look of the ship, whereas in the much with, like, the Andor Mark One you've got a much smaller TOS era set of um, hulls to work with. Mm. And, you know, the, the, with the size of the photon torpedoes not decreasing, it's going to be much more obvious, if you like. Yes. yes. Now, I need to, I need to do, do this at some point, a scale test to work out how many photon torpedoes could actually be contained in the Danube's roll bar. Yeah. Because I don't think it's that many. Like, it's not a huge roll bar. Uh, you know, maybe one or two. Yeah, well, I suppose it depends if you want to, if they're using full size torpedoes or these micro torpedoes that people have discussed at various points. Yeah, well, micro torpedoes are like a. I, in fact, I had someone suggest a concept. Was it on the most recent? Yeah, it was on. The one that came out, so not the most one recent one that we've recorded, but the one that came out um, this week was where we did the 20-minute rant on torpedoes. And someone suggested, why not have a effectively a Merv-style torpedo that carries a bunch of micro-torpedoes? Mm. And to which my response was, well, you could, but you're then going to have to make your launcher bigger and then that's more force also just devoted in towards one target. Yeah. And what if you missed with one of those things? Yeah, I, I, the the only time that kind of Merv micro torpedo situation thing makes any real sense to me would be, um, potentially in that kind of late TOS early lost era period where cloaked starships were known about but they mm. couldn't quite get a finger on you know um locating them like they could va they could vaguely work out that there was something nearby but not exactly where to shoot at which point all, all, in some ways almost a way with the same way that the enterprise e tries to find the scimitar and nemesis you could fire off one of these things, which then scatters into a bunch of micro torpedoes, at which point the objective isn't necessarily to do significant damage to the enemy. It's just to saturate space with enough explosives that you'll hit something and then that'll tell you where they are, which you can then focus yes. more firepower on. Um, yes, well, that, that, that is interesting um, because, like I say, I'm, I'm looking at um, this will have all, well, some of the episode will have come out by the time this goes out mm. uh, with Wings of Romulus and this series that I'm doing and it's mostly covering the Lost Era. It starts out in the motion picture and then moves into the Lost Era and I I've previously talked about how yeah, clo anti-cloaking tactics are very limited but equally cloaks are not, they're not quite TNG level cloaks yet where you have to use you know, tachyon grids and, you know, all all these kind of complex systems, you can kind of go off of, as you kind of suggested, go off your nose a little bit. Uh, or, in fact, kind of literally, because that's how they catch uh, General Chang's ship. Yes. Yeah, although that's a little bit unorthodox in tactics. Um, the, the only other, the only other, like, micro-torpedo cluster munition scenario that I can maybe there's one or two yeah i mean then another one would potentially be in the era of ds9 type fleet battles 
Um, mm -hmm. If your opponents start fielding large numbers of fighters, kind of like how the Federation starts fielding peregrines, then if you're if you're about to be swarm attacked by a huge formation of them, then something like that might make sense because it would allow yeah, you to have yeah. a single standard torpedo launcher, and then you could just fire one of these things out, and then you know it splits into I'd say a dozen micro torpedoes that each of which is sufficient to kill a fighter. And they can yes. go off and target different things. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, I mean, that would, would be, be the most sensible use. I mean, that actually... actually I am I never going to hear the end of the Peregrine now, mm. now that I've thrown <laughs> my hat into that arena. Oh, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> the well, response to my, the response. Well, the, and that Lord did then a stream uh, yeah. responding to my response. Yeah. And then I jumped on the stream. Yeah. yeah I'm, I, 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 have, I have clearly... Uh, you kicked a hornet's a hill. nest. Well, yeah. I've picked I've picked a hill now. Uh, whether or not I die on it, who knows? But yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, I mean, I, I I like that idea. Mm. Whether or not you'd think fighters are worthwhile enough to actually bother with that, or you just have small attack ships that go and harry them away. Mm. You know, I could imagine you carrying them. I could imagine, but I don't think they'd be used that often yeah i mean it, it, i guess it's one of those things isn't it of um the, the way i always look at discussions around the viability of things that we see in canon you broadly speaking you these arguments generally devolve down into three camps you have kind of on the one hand you have people who say actually this makes no sense it's stupid which mm you can make arguments about it but then at the same time it appears in canon and the people in canon aren't treating it as entirely stupid at which point um either they're idiots or or you're missing something um yeah it, it is kind of a very awkward thing to 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 do um or the other extreme is no they're completely 100% perfectly effective and make perfect sense which has its own problems of you know like why haven't we seen them before <laughs> mm. <laughs> where have they been yeah, all yeah. this time uh, and then you kind of have the the intermediate which is usually where i try and sit which is kind of they're obviously canon they obviously have some kind of use at least in certain situations so let's try and work out why why that is and if they don't show up elsewhere potentially what is it about that particular situation that makes them effective that means they're not effective in in other places which is kind of what we discussed in one of the previous q and a's where we talked about you know in a high e c m environment where they can't just be picked off by instant phaser blasts they might make mm. sense but in individual ship engagements where the, that massive ECM field isn't present, they don't make sense. <laughs> Which kind of, it yes. explains why they appear in the big DS9 fleet battles and basically nowhere else except for wandering around the Badlands, which has its own set of sensor issues. Yes. yes. Yeah, I yeah, mean, I in mean, terms, terms of, yeah, yeah the, I, the, the the balancing act of, you know, accepting, accepting what, is in, what is shown in canon, but also then uh, dealing with it in a sensible way. So, for example, one of the big things for me is the fact that the Dedurodex supposedly has in canon this main massive forward disruptor and that's its main armament and I'm like yeah but that's not what Andrew Prober planned mm. Andrew Prober planned it to shoot disruptors from its eyes yes you know which would have looked really cool and then the effects guys didn't want to do it for whatever reason so you know partially it's a rule of cool at play there but also it's like well if he's it's if this is what the designer intended they probably know this better the design better and you know the people who just go over it in effects afterwards you know so i'm more inclined to take his intention and his word rather than what the what the effects guys had to you know slap together on a, on a short schedule <laughs> so yeah. I suppose it ties into it ties into that Gene Roddenberry idea again that it's it's sort of it's representational but not actually what's what you're actually seeing. Yeah. 
yeah, you have to make certain allowances, but for the most part, trying to make everything work together, I think, is the better is the better approach. Um, because yes. other, the, 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 the more and more extreme to one end or the other that you go, the more and more completely ad hoc justifications you have to make up. And OK, balance, the balancing act requires you to make up justifications as well. But at least for the most part, they're usually in universe justifications of things that could plausibly be there that we don't see as opposed mm. to in one way or the other concluding that some or all of the main characters must be absolute morons <laughs> yes yeah. Yeah. yeah i mean it's I mean, it's, it's like, like why, why i added, I added um, um why the why dominion the war, war in, in you know hmm. how i portray it in my show is you know has all these different Cardassian ships that aren't in ds9 well because otherwise if I, if i didn't do that it would get pretty stale pretty fast just seeing Galors, Hideki's, Jem'Hadar fighters and battle cruisers. Yeah. There's only so much. So you you do need to kind of you know, if you want to go in depth, you need to kind of take some take some additional supplies with you if you want. If you want to if you want to you know, delve deep into the kind of the obscure parts of lore. Yeah, and I, it, it, to, to a certain extent, I'm also thinking it, the, the kind of approach that you've taken, which is kind of one of the reasons why I started watching the, that the, the your channel when it came to those the the various series you were doing, was um, it, in a way I guess you can kind of riff off of what we mentioned earlier with Gene Roddenberry saying that um, movie TOS era w was had always been the case, um, mm. in as much as you could almost then view the main see the the actual series that we see broadcast are mm. almost like the the tos series they are the the they are the edited highlights of what was going on which yes. are presented to the to the 23rd or 24th depending on whatever series you're talking about century audience um but a lot of what else is out there doesn't get explicitly mentioned in the shows because it's got a very monomaniacal focus on particular people and particular ships and particular events uh, and so all these other things exist they just exist kind of out there in the background for other people who are who want to dig deeper to discover and you, you kind yeah, of see yeah. that in a, in a lot of ways when you look at the if you look at the kind of the, the pop culture let's say looking at world war Two. Yes. Or even World War One. Yeah, the, the the average person, the average Joe on the street, if they've just been taking in the pop culture, most commonly produced World War Two stuff, would think that, you know, every in when it came to the navy, you'd have battleships, carriers, and submarines, and mm. that's it. Yeah, uh, yes. the bunch of people, apart from the fact that maybe some things like HMS Belfast exist, wouldn't even necessarily be aware that such things as destroyers and cruisers even existed, let alone what yeah. they did, and you know, let alone things like um, motor torpedo boats or seaplane tenders, escort carriers, um, mm. uh, and all the various battles that they that those various ships all got involved in uh, up and down different scales, like. The 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 U-boat hunting groups made of corvettes, or the the raiding squadrons of cruisers and destroyers in the Bay of Biscay, and things like that. People don't mm. know about them, and if you ask them, oh, what what's a river class frigate in World War Two, they'd be like, what's a frigate? <laughs> Firstly, yeah, yeah. and then what the heck are you on about? Um, and I think it's uh, yeah, that it's I think it's a similar thing of you know we we see the big. The big name ships, kind of like the War Spike, the end. Well, ironically enough, the Enterprise, the Yamato, the Bismarck mm. equivalents in the show, but all the little, yeah, yeah. the little ships and the 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 stuff that fills out the fleet roster, we don't see. But then we kind of we do see when we come to a series like like the ones that you do. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think that is a very good way. I mean, then you get into a whole. Um, you know, matter of well, is this all is it all Federation propaganda, or is it just you know declassified? I suppose it it would make sense that it was particularly with DS Nine. I can't imagine that was being made as propaganda because it's not very good propaganda. Uh, so it's probably declassified. Uh, 
documentation. I mean, it's also like why, for example, in uh, Wings of Romulus, uh, there are little moments where I will, I think in the Scimitar episode, I say, oh, it blew up because of, or the, the narrator says, it blew up because of a fault with the Thaleron core. When, of course, Data blew it up, but the Romulans would rather not admit that. Yes. You know, so, you know, there's, there's, you know, playing with the narrative, well, not playing with the narrative, but the relation, your relationship to the truth and whether or not, yes, I suppose, the only way to play with it sensibly is you accept um, what is shown on screen as canon, as true, or as true as can possibly be. And then you work out, well, okay, but how can we manipulate this? How can we, you know, play with it? How can we, you know, how can I take a shot from a certain episode that's meant to say a certain thing? And actually, if I put it in a different light, suddenly it means something completely different. Yeah, the, um, I mean, I got kind of thinking of things like, you know, DS9 as a series could almost be if you put it in 24 centuries like captain like after cisco mysteriously disappears mm. you could almost imagine it being like a multi-part series on federation news broadcast or like the life and times of captain cisco hero of the <laughs> dominion war and why he vanished mysteriously at the end of it um yes something like that and then you've got and you know, I suppose in some ways you you could almost look at it as the he he in some ways although he wasn't that high ranked he's almost like the general pattern like the yeah. the, the, the character that ever the, the federation has latched onto as the exemplar person for the dominion war um the same way the americans latched onto pattern for the european part of world war Two. but then if you read books about pattern they present the british in general montgomery in particular in a very specific usually negative light but mm. then you go and you look at exactly the same event um but from the recollections by or montgomery or by books written about montgomery where he's the central focus and they're looking at pattern um for, from <laughs> from third party perspective and it's a completely different perspective on both men um and then you get yeah, like yeah. The, the, the on the on the third hand the the myth on the mutant third hand you get um you know the books by the german generals that they were fighting which mm -hmm. have have an, yet another thing and as you say it's kind of each of them will present a slightly different or in some cases a very radically different perspective on what's going on and will highlight different elements um that are maybe completely omitted in in the other accounts but Yes. yes they're all telling the they're all telling the same event but from three different perspectives with three different interpretations and the truth is somewhere in the middle yes, yes. i mean actually I mean, and yeah. with, with that, that dominion war, war um sort of, sort of storyline story particularly, particularly because um because i think ultimately it's a very um big it's a very big thing to take on and one of the things that i have done is done essentially perspective episodes so for example um you know you have the there's klingon episodes i think there's a total of three episodes three klingon episodes now so there's the battle of sector 73 epsilon which is about the klingon invasion of cardassia way back in way of the warrior and there's the battle of arcadia um and then there's the uh, the, uh, the battle, battle or, well i've called it now uh kachang's last stand by the way check that one out mm -hmm. um and they're they're kind of they have their own sub narrative for starters you know this is this is the klingon's focus so for example the the big uh there's the reoccurring character here is general kachang well he doesn't start out as general kachang but you know he works his way up until well kachang's last stand um guess what happens to him then <laughs> but yes. it's 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 telling the the war from the from the klingon perspective and also to an extent the opponent's perspective because it's impossible when you're you know when you're telling of a battle you've kind of got to talk about the two sides because otherwise it's going to be a very kind of going in a little bit blind otherwise mm. 
And then similarly, you I have I think now two Romulan episodes, Raptors Revenge and Battle of the Giants, which are you know completely from the Romulan perspective, and you know their approach to the war and you know what it consists of for them is very different to the other three, to the other two. Yeah. So it's it's a, it's a good way then of yeah creating those different perspectives, whilst also telling that bigger story and keeping it consistent with each other. Yeah, yeah.